Good morning. And it's really good to be here with you. Um, for me, it's always a special privilege to be back in the state of Michigan. I have lived many different places in my life, but I have lived more years in the state of Michigan than any other place. And Berrien County is one of the three counties in Michigan I've lived in. I've lived in Berrien County, Calhoun County in Battle Creek, and Washtenaw County in the Annaba Ypsilanti area. So it's always a, a pleasure and privilege to be back home, um, in a sense. And I have lots of friends in the audience, and it's really a, a privilege to be here with you. Let me set some ground rules. What I'm going to do, and, and I'm sharing the ground rules I usually share on the first day of class to my undergraduate students. What, what I'm going to do today is review the science that exists on the role of racism in health and what we can do about it. Um, I approach the topic as a scientist, um, and this is not about ideology, it's not about politics. I want to give you a clear understanding of what the science shows. Um, some of what I say will be shocking to some of you, um, but I want you to clearly understand the message that, that, that I'm bringing and what the evidence um, suggests, and I welcome any questions you will have. There is no question that's a bad question. So any question that crosses your mind about any of the material I present is relevant, um, and there's a mechanism that has been shared with you to, to, to share it. Um, whether you think the question does not agree with something I said or not is not a point. I usually tell my students I learn more from people who disagree with me than from people who agree with me. So I welcome a variety of perspectives, but we will have a scientific conversation, and I'll share with you the science in response to any of the questions you ask. But I, I do hope that although much of this presentation is going to be me sharing information, that at the end of the day we want to have a, a dialogue and we want to have a conversation, and I do want you to clearly understand the material I present so that we can be um, on the same page, at least in terms of this is what the science says on this particular topic. Is that okay? All right, great. So I'm going to jump right into my talk. Um, I am a sociologist who studies health, and I am very concerned about the patterns of health in the United States. Um, what are the problems of health in the United States? The, the single biggest problem of health in the United States is that we are not the healthiest people in the world. Now, why is that important? Well, the U.S. spends more money on medical care per person and more money absolutely than any other country in the world. In fact, according to the World Bank, half of the money spent on medical care in the world each year is spent in the United States. We are less than 5% of the world's population, consume one half of its medical resources, and rank near the bottom of the industrialized world on health. So here is one example of it. Life expectancy is, on average, how long do individuals live? And you can see in 1980, America ranked 11th in the world on life expectancy. In 2014, we ranked 35th. Although we lead the world in medical care spending, 33, 34 countries do better than we do. We rank behind countries like South Korea, Greece, Cyprus, Cuba, and Lebanon, are countries where health is better than in the great USA. And I'm going to talk about race and health in a minute, but it's not just the minorities that are doing badly. If white America were a country in 2014, it would rank 34th in the world on life expectancy. If black America were a country, it would rank 96th in the world on life expectancy. So as a nation, we face an enormous challenge um, that we need to address. So while I'll talk about the gaps in health by race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status, and so on, and, and these are large, and these are things we need to uh, understand and address, we need to address them in the context of the reality that all Americans are far less healthy than we could or should be, and we need to come together to find ways where we can improve the health of all, even as we uh, reduce large gaps in health by race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. So there are large racial differences in health in the United States. I'll give you a global pattern. 
For racial groups that have been in the United States for a long time, blacks or African Americans, I'll use those terms interchangeably, American Indians and Alaska Natives or Native Americans, Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders, we have more data on the topic for blacks than for other groups, but a pattern is the same for um, American Indians and Native Hawaiians. Groups that have been here for a long time, disadvantaged groups that have been here for a long time, have much worse health than the US average. For groups that are heavily made up of immigrants, a different pattern emerges, at least initially. If we look at national data for the US, on overall death rates, on infant mortality, immigrants of all racial ethnic groups have better health than their native-born counterparts. White immigrants have better health than whites born in the US. Black immigrants have better health than blacks born in the US. Hispanic immigrants have better health than Hispanics born in the US. Asian immigrants have better health than Asians born in the US. Across the board, there's a healthy immigrant effect, at least initially. That's the good news. The bad news is, the longer immigrants stay in the US, the worse their health becomes. It's almost as if the data is saying there's something about the American way of life that's dangerous to your health. And we need to identify what that is and see what we can do to improve it. Let me give you one concrete example of racial disparities in health in the United States. This is life expectancy, not life expectancy, infant mortality in the United States 2012. This is infant mortality refers to the chances of a baby dying before its first birthday. And we usually report it as the deaths per 1,000 live births. And you could see that African Americans and Native Americans have a markedly elevated risk compared to the white population, with Latinos being just similar to, to, to whites and the Asian Pacific Islander category actually doing better than that of whites. The Asian and Latino data must be taken into account. That's everybody. And if we could dis disaggregate the data by US born versus foreign born, we would see some differences within those categories. When my career started some time ago, researchers believed that racial differences in health were simply a function of racial differences in socioeconomic status, income, education, occupational status. And if you looked at persons at different, from different races at the same level of education or income, there would be no effect of race because it was all about socioeconomic status. We now know that life is more complicated. And I'm going to illustrate that with one set of data, but this is true for a broad range of outcomes across the US. Life expectancy at age 25. That is, at age 25, how long will the average person live? And if you look at the data for blacks and whites, at age 25, life expectancy of whites is, whites live five years longer than blacks. So there's a five-year gap at age 25 with how long blacks and whites will live. If we look at the same data by education level within the white population, tell me there's a delay here, okay. Um, education level within the, the white population, you see something intriguing that's a really important point. Although in the US we tend to focus on racial differences in health, for most health outcomes in national data, the gaps in health by socioeconomic status, income or education, are larger than the gaps in health by race. So there's a five-year black-white difference. But a white person with a college degree or more education lives 6.4 years longer than a white person who has not finished high school. So that 6.4 is bigger than five. And if we look within African Americans, we see a 5.3-year gap, again bigger than five, between an African American with a college degree or more education and an African American who has not finished high school. So what this tells us, there is something profound about income and education. I'm only showing you the education data, the income data show the same pattern. There's something profound of, about income and education, regardless of your race, that affects your risk of health. But the data also tells us something else, that there is something else about race that matters at every level of education. So white high school dropouts, live on average 3.1 years longer than black high school dropouts, and as education increases, the gap widens, so the black-white gap among college degree or more education is 4.2 years, and arguably one of the most stunning findings I'm showing you today is that if we look at blacks who are best off, 
with a college degree or more education, they have the highest level of education of life expectancy for blacks. At the same time, at the same time, they have lower life expectancy than whites with a college degree, lower life expectancy than whites with some college education, and yes, this is national data for the U.S. Blacks with a college degree or more education have lower life expectancy than whites who have finished high school. So these data clearly say there is something profound about income and education that matters for your health, irrespective of your race or ethnicity. But there's something else profound about race that continues to matter for health. And so researchers, and I have been part of that group of researchers that have been asking the question, could racism be a critical missing piece of the puzzle to understand the patterning of racial differences in health? So I want to review kind of what we know about the role of racism in health. Um, and I'll do that by telling you a little bit of what I like to call the house that racism built. What do I mean by racism? When I say racism, I am not talking primarily about the beliefs and attitudes of individuals. I'm talking about the system, a system that categorizes and ranks individuals, that devalues, disempowers, and differentially allocates resources and opportunities to different groups. Central to the development of racism is an ideology of inferiority that some groups are better off than others, and that can lead to negative attitudes or beliefs, prejudice and stereotypes, or to differential treatment, that is discrimination. But the core to racism is this system that has devalued and disempowered and, and differentially allocated resources to individuals. Let me illustrate that by talking about the difference between individual discrimination and institutional discrimination. Researchers at Portland State University ask a simple question. When a black person stands at a crosswalk in the great city of Portland, intending to cross a street, does your race determine how long it takes for you to cross the street? How long you have to wait for cars to pause for you to cross the street? And so they took three black males and three white males, dressed them identically, and put them at different crosswalks in the city of Portland at different times of day, all of them intending to do the same thing. And what they found was that multiple cars were twice as likely to pass a black pedestrian intending to cross the street, and that on average, blacks had to wait, I think somehow, okay, blacks had to wait 32% longer to cross the street. Now that's individual discrimination. We're talking about what individual drivers did faced with the stimulus of a person intending to cross the street. I want to give you an example of institutional discrimination. This is national data for the United States from 2012. People waiting at the precinct to vote in the presidential election. How long did people have to wait to vote by race and ethnicity in the US? And you could see on average, across the US, a black person waited 23 minutes. On average, across the US, a white person waited 12 minutes. So there's a difference in how long people waited to vote. However, none of that reflected the attitudes, discrimination of precinct workers. Instead, it was heavily driven by where you voted and what were the budgetary allocations provided for different places, what was the size of the precinct facility where you voted, what was the level of staffing that was available at that place. So remember, we saw systematic differences in how long people waited to vote, but none of it reflected individual behavior. In fact, it reflected administrative and policy decisions linked to different places, but systematically resulted in discrimination because your race determined on average how long you voted. And that's what we call institutional discrimination. It's policies that are embedded in administrative procedures, in laws, in institutions that nonetheless produce unequal outcomes, even though all the people, all the precinct workers, were just doing their job and smiling the same at every voter coming to vote. So do we have 
examples of how institutional discrimination contributes to racial inequities in health. One of the aspects of institutional discrimination I have studied is residential segregation. Residential segregation is a deeply embedded policy um, in American society that determined where individuals could live based on their race. Um, that reflected where Native Americans were allowed to live or restricted to live in, but it also reflected the residential isolation of African, African Americans in the U.S. in the late 19th and early 20th century. And you're saying, well, what does segregation have to do with health? John Sell was a historian at Duke University. He wrote a book about the origins of segregation in the U.S. South and South Africa. Sell argues that segregation was one of the most successful policies of the 20th century in the United States. It's beneath the radar screen. No politician is talking about it, but it has pervasive negative effects. One of the intriguing things that Sell shows is that the framers of apartheid in South Africa in the early 20th century looked across the Atlantic and saw the segregation implemented in the U.S. in the late 19th century and said, brilliant, we will implement that in our country and we will tweak it in ways to make it South African. And you're saying, but I still am lost. What does segregation have to do with health? Well, if we stop and think about it, where you live, for most Americans, determine where you go to school, determines the quality of education you receive determines access to job opportunities, determines the quality of housing and neighborhood environments, determines whether it's easy or difficult uh, to live a healthy lifestyle in your neighborhood. It determines the level of physical, chemical, toxic exposures. It determines even access to high-quality medical care, the quality of city services. A broad range of outcomes are heavily driven by place. So much so, in public health today, many researchers say that your zip code is a stronger predictor of how long and how well you live in the United States than your genetic code. Um, give you one example, these are some maps um, my, my team produced when I was working with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's Commission to Build a Healthy America. And this is a map of New Orleans. We've produced maps for multiple cities in the United States. And as you can see, in the great city of New Orleans, there's a 25-year difference in life expectancy just linked to which neighborhood people live in. 25-year difference. People living in the same community, you get that much difference linked to place because place is a powerful driver of the opportunities and resources that, in fact, shape health. Two of America's most eminent sociologists, William Julius Wilson and Robert Sampson, studied the 171 largest cities in the United States and said there's not even one city where whites live under equal conditions to blacks and that the worst urban context in which whites reside is considerably better than the average context of black communities. All of that has been produced by the history and the legacy of residential segregation in the United States. And this residential segregation is consequential for a range of outcomes. There are large racial differences in income and education, which we understand. They don't come out of thin air. They are driven by processes linked to segregation. So I'm drawing here on the work of David Cutler, um, until recently the dean of the social sciences at Harvard, one of America's leading economists, using fancy econometric models I cannot even fully describe. But he's able to show statistically, if you could erase segregation in America, you would completely wipe out black-white differences in income, education, and unemployment, and reduce black-white differences in single motherhoods by two-thirds, because all of those are driven by opportunities linked to place in American life. So segregation is a powerful driver of inequalities in America, but it's an institutional mechanism, it's not what individuals are doing at a local level. How large are these inequities in, in socioeconomic status in the U.S.? I want to give you an example by looking at median household income in the U.S. This is data from the U.S. Census Bureau for the year 2015. I've just put it in a way where you can't possibly miss the point. So I'm standardizing on the income of whites as a dollar. And I'm saying, for every dollar of household income, this is household, not individual, white households receive, 
Asian households receive a dollar and 23 cents. Asian households are almost 70% of Asian households are, are immigrants. Um, and Asian households have markedly higher levels of education than whites on average. But more importantly, Asian households have more persons contributing to household income than any other racial category. So if I did a per person income measure, whites would be number one. But if we look at the historically disadvantaged groups, for every dollar of household income white households receive, this is in 2015, Hispanic households receive 72 cents for every dollar, Native American households 62 cents, and African American households 59 cents. Do you know what is stunning about the 59 cents figure? That is identical to the racial gap in income in 1978. I did not misspeak. In 1978, the peak year of the gains of narrowing the black-white gap in income as a result of the anti-poverty policies of the 1960s and the civil rights um, legislation of the 1960s, blacks had reduced the gap to 59 cents. And in 2015, the gap is 59 cents. It's not that it has been stable over time. It, throughout the decade of the 1980s, it fell from the 59 cents figure, and it was not until 1994 that it got back up to 59 cents. What I'm saying is, most of my students think that we have been on a constant upward trajectory of reducing racial inequalities in health, which is not what, this is federal government data, you can go online and find this, shows that the black-white gap in income today is identical to what it was in 1978. And racial data on income dramatically understates the racial differences in socioeconomic status. Why do I say that? Because income only captures the flow of resources into the household. It tells us nothing about the economic reserves that households have to cushion shortfalls of income. I think this my point is giving me more trouble than I thought. Okay, at some point, could someone get in place? I may have to tell you next, just so we can move along uh, quickly. Um, the okay, uh, if we look at wealth data, this is the most recent wealth data um, for the most recent wealth data for the U.S. from the Census Bureau report, a 2014 report, but it was 2011 wealth data. For every dollar of wealth white households have, black households have six pennies, and Latino households have seven pennies. Why is that important? Because wealth captures the economic reserves that a household has. It shows how close minority families are to being homeless if there's a shortfall in income. There is very little economic reserves as is captured by wealth. But most importantly, the point I am making is that the racial differences in income, education, and wealth really illustrate something profound about our society, about institutional mechanisms that are operating and that are doing exactly what they were intended to do. The racial gaps in income and education, based on the best scientific research, are not acts of God, didn't just happen, they're not random events, they don't come out of thin air, they actually reflect the successful implementation of social policies. Social policies doing exactly what they were intended to do with institutional racism really producing a rigged system in the United States. Okay, I've talked about segregation. I want to talk about individual discrimination. There's a lot of evidence of the pervasiveness and persistence of discrimination in the United States. And I showed you one example of racial differences in how long it takes to cross the street. There's high quality scientific evidence suggesting racial differences in a broad range of outcomes in American society. More than I have time to really go over. The evidence is overwhelming in so many domains of life there is high quality evidence of the persistence of racial discrimination. Let me give you one example of a study done in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, not that far from here, where a researcher took two black males and two white males, dressed them similarly, sent them to apply for 350 entry-level jobs. 
gave them identical resumes. So the resumes were identical. She threw a wrinkle into the study. One of the black males and one of the white males on his resume indicated he was out on parole. He had served an 18-month uh, sentence for cocaine possession. So one of the two had a criminal record. Now, what she found was what we would expect to find. Whether you were black or white, if you had a criminal record, you were less likely to get a call back for a job. However, she also found what we did not expect to find. It was easier for a white male with a felony conviction to get a call back for a job than a black male whose record was clean. Remember, the resumes were identical. So it's an example of the persistence of discrimination, and I could speak for the next two hours reviewing studies, documenting the persistence of discrimination in American society. I have been interested in one subset of discrimination. What about those experiences of discrimination that people are aware of? Could it be that that is a type of stressful life experience that has negative effects on health? Martin Luther King was not a scientist, but if he was right, that discrimination is a hellhound that knows that Negroes in every waking moment of their lives, declaring that the lie of their inferiority is accepted as a truth in the society dominating them. If that's true, then it has to have consequences. So one of the things I developed was measures to capture experiences of discrimination. I developed different measures. I'm only going to talk about one of them today, the Everyday Discrimination Scale. It's a measure that tries to capture the day-to-day -day little indignities. It's not the big things, not, not getting a job, uh, being stopped and threatened by the police. It's just the little day-to-day -day indignities. It captures things like you've been treated with less courtesy or respect than others, receiving poorer service than others at restaurants or stores. People act as if you are not smart or if they're afraid of you. Um, people act as if they think you are dishonest. Just little day-to-day indignities. And just to illustrate the work in this area, I'm drawing on the research of one researcher, Dr. Tenny Lewis, who was at Yale University, uh, completed these studies. Each line on this slide reflects a different study. In all of the studies, she's looking at the exposure, it's everyday discrimination, for different health outcomes, and looking at what's the relationship between everyday discrimination and health. And what she finds, higher levels of everyday discrimination leads to more higher levels of coronary artery calcification. That is followed over five years. That is the more rapid development of heart disease as measured in your heart, coronary arteries. High levels of everyday discrimination leads to higher levels of inflammation. High levels of everyday discrimination leads to higher blood pressure. Pregnant women who report everyday discrimination give birth to lower birth weight infants. A study of the elderly followed over time, higher levels of everyday discrimination predicts more rapid declines in cognitive function over time. A community sample, higher levels of everyday discrimination predicts poorer sleep. A study of adults followed over time, everyday discrimination is an independent predictor of premature death. High levels of everyday discrimination means you literally die faster, statistically adjusting for other risk factors. And a study of black and white women, high levels of everyday discrimination, unrelated to subcutaneous fat, that's abdominal fat that's right under your skin, but a powerful predictor of visceral fat is the deep internal fat between your internal organs. And why is that relevant? It's visceral fat that increases your risk for heart disease and stroke and diabetes. Let me make another point here that's really important because it says something about how we relate to each other and the particular moment we live in and the importance of civility. When I developed the everyday discrimination scale, I was most interested in trying to understand the lived experiences of African Americans and other minorities. My secretary at the University of Michigan at the time, who was white, when I called it the everyday racism scale, was my first draft and had her type it up and put it in the format to be administered. She said, this is not racism, this happens to me every day. And so I changed the name based on her input. We were a team from the everyday racism scale to the everyday discrimination scale. Because what we have found in research is that all groups experience discrimination. These measures of everyday discrimination is the most widely used measure of discrimination around the world. It works in other countries as well, predicts powerfully outcomes. 
And whites in the U.S. report everyday discrimination, and the effects on health are similar whether you're black or white. What we have found is minorities report higher levels of everyday discrimination than whites, but whites who report discrimination, we find exactly the same findings. What does that say to us? Is that each of us can be an agent that promotes good health just by the way we relate to others, or promote poor health just how we treat one another. It's a powerful indictment. and a reminder that we can have a huge impact. Let me give you one other study about discrimination and how powerful the effects of discrimination are. Jean Brody is a researcher at the University of Georgia. He's been studying a cohort of African-American adolescents. He measured the levels of discrimination experienced at age 16, age 17, and age 18. And at age 20, now I didn't say age 40, I said at age 20, African-American teens who report high levels of discrimination as a teenager consistently, at age 20, they have higher levels of not depressive symptoms, not mental health, but higher levels of stress hormones, cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine, systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, weight, and C uh, a CRP, C-reactive protein. So their biological dysregulation is evident at age 20, linked to experiences of discrimination as a teenager. So it's a dramatic example of these effects of exposure to discrimination having effects on health very early in life. I want to leave you with some good news about discrimination. Researchers have documented there are a number of, of factors that can reduce the negative effects of discrimination in health. I just told you how discrimination as a teenager is linked to biological dysregulation by age 20. That relationship does not exist if these, those teenagers are embedded in relationships of social support. If they're receiving good social support from family, friends, and teachers, the relationship does not exist. There's other research that suggests similar effects are evident for religious involvement and engagement, and similar effects are also evident for some positive psychological resources, so that the context and the support and resilience factors can play a role in reducing the negative effects of discrimination on health. So I've talked about segregation as an institutional mechanism of racism. I've talked about individual discrimination and the effects it has. I want to talk about discrimination that's deeply embedded in our culture, in our stereotypes that can lead to implicit and explicit bias and can lead to the stigmatization of various groups within our society. There is a lot of evidence that indicates that there are negative beliefs about race that are literally in the air that we breathe. They are deeply embedded in our culture. Some researchers are very creative. A group of researchers created a database of American culture, 10 million words. They've put in this database the books, articles, newspaper stories that the average American edu college educated would read over their lifetime. What's brilliant about this is if you've put American culture in a database, you can now look at this database and say, when the word black appears in American culture, what adjective most frequently co-occurs with black. And what the answer is, is poor, then violent, then religious, then lazy, then cheerful, then dangerous. When white occurs, wealthy, progressive, conventional, stubborn, successful, educated. For the fun of it, when female occurs, distant, Okay, if someone is there, can you help me? <laughs> Distant, warm, gentle, passive, male, dominant, leader, logical, strong. Let's go to the next slide. You know, go back one. Yes, this is the 10 most common stereotypes found in this database. The, 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 the measures next to it is a measure of associative strength. You can think of them as a simple correlation coefficient. If it's one, 
If it goes up to 1.0, it means when the two words appear, they always are tied together. So the bigger the number, the more closely tied these associations are in, in American culture. So look at, there are negative stereotypes for whites, but you could see the associative strength is much weaker, so they're not as strongly tied together for, as the negative stereotypes for African Americans. But you see violent, dangerous, um, lazy, very, very strongly tied with being African American. What does that mean? Folks, this has profound implications for one of the issues we, as we are struggling with in American society, police shootings of unarmed black males. What this means to me, what I learned from this, is that if a police officer views an unarmed black male as more violent and more dangerous than he actually is in reality, we are not necessarily dealing with a bad cop. We may be simply looking at a normal American who is reflected what is deeply embedded in his mind based on being raised in this society. Because what research indicates is that these negative stereotypes are in our minds, irrespective of our race, they are in our minds, and they shape our behavior when we meet individuals and they trigger discrimination. Okay, I think I need help again. Um, internalized racism is believing the negative beliefs about society also has negative effects on health. In the interest of time, I'm not going to talk about that. The point I want to make is I've talked about the ways in which institutional mechanisms of racism, segregation, individual discrimination, and the stereotypes in our culture shape a broad range of outcomes, including health, but it's a broad range of other outcomes, and that the inequalities reinforce the stereotypes. And we say, uh-huh, the stereotypes are in fact real and are in fact correct. And that goes right back to support the stereotypes and the system of racism in the same place. Okay, what can we do about this? Next slide. Next slide. What can we do? The first thing we need to do is to provide high-quality care to every individual. And I could imagine someone says, did you come here all the way from Boston to tell us that? That's a no-brainer. Uh, we, we, we know that. I mean, that... But I'm suggesting it is a very, very hard thing to do. Next slide. Um, I'm drawing here on work uh, from a report published by the National Academy of Medicine, it used to be called the Institute of Medicine, in 2003. Um, next slide. Uh, this is the press release um, from the Washington Post um, of the National Academy of Medicine. I served on the panel. Um, I had more hair back then um, in 2002. Um, what did the Na Institute of Medicine find back then in, in 2002, this unequal treatment report? Well, first, let me give you the context for this report. The U.S. Congress voted to ask the Institute of Medicine, which is an independent medical body, to answer a simple question. When blacks and other minorities enter healthcare context in the US, does their race or ethnicity determine not whether they get care or not, but the quality and intensity of care that they receive? And what we did on that panel, we didn't do any new research, we just reviewed the existing scientific evidence. And at that time, there were about 180 studies that had answered, addressed that question, and 80% of them found that across virtually every therapeutic intervention, from the most simple medical procedure to the most complex, blacks and other minorities receive poorer quality care and less intensive care than whites. Let me give you a concrete example. I'll go to Dr. Knox Todd, who was an emergency room physician at UCLA Medical Center. And Dr. Todd asked a simple question. When a patient comes into the UCLA emergency department with a long bone fracture, that's medical speak for a broken bone in the arm or legs. Okay, you get a picture? A patient with a broken bone. Does your race or ethnicity determine whether you get pain medication or not? And Dr. Todd looked at everybody treated at UCLA for one year and found that 55% of Latino patients did not get pain medication compared to 26% of non-Hispanic whites. He was a good researcher. He said it's something else. So statistically, he took into account 
whether they spoke English or not, whether they got injured on the job or not, what time they showed up at the ER, how long they spent in the ER, how severe was the fracture, and after statistically adjusting for everything else, the single biggest factor determining whether a patient got pain medication was whether the patient was Hispanic or not. And Hispanics were seven and a half times less likely to get pain medication after statistically adjusting for everything else. Dr. Todd moved from UCLA to Emory University in Atlanta and repeated the same study at three emergency rooms in Atlanta, looking at blacks and whites, and found exactly the same thing. A black person with a broken bone and an arm or legs goes into the emergency de department, is less likely to get pain medication compared to a white person. And the question is, how on earth can we possibly make sense of this? And folks, remember, don't focus on pain. I'm just showing you one study. There were 180 studies. Most of them were in the area of cardiovascular disease. But they were in every area of medicine, in small hospitals, in large hospitals, in academic medical centers, in small community hospitals. This was a global pattern in the United States. The best explanation our committee came to in 2002 was a phenomenon that social psychologists have studied for decades called unconscious or unthinking discrimination or implicit bias. And I want to be very clear. This is not about physicians or American physicians. This is not about white people or white doctors. This is a phenomenon about how all human beings process information. We process the complex cognitive information we face every day by putting things into categories. But what the research shows, if we have a category deeply embedded in our mind based on our socialization for which we have negative attributes, my next two words are important. Automatically and unconsciously, when you meet someone who you identify as belonging to a category that in your mind you have a negative belief about, you will treat that person differently. That is, you will discriminate against that person. Research indicates that in American society, we make that judgment about somebody in one-third of the time it takes to blink our eyes. I tell my students I am a prejudiced person. And I like to think of myself as a prejudiced person because I like to think of myself as a normal human being. And if you are a normal human being, you are probably prejudiced. Now, I didn't say you were racially prejudiced, because race is only one basis of prejudice within our society. It's only one negative social category. If you have negative stereotypes deeply embedded in your mind about gay people, about fat people, about women, about old people, about people who come from this country or that country. You get the point. Every society, every culture has in-groups and out-groups, have groups that are viewed positively and groups that are not viewed negatively. And this is part of the human condition, and it's true of all of us. What differs is where we were raised, what was the content of our socialization, and who were the out-groups. But these are normal human processes that affects the way all of us process information every day. This is work of Dr. Lisa Cooper from Johns Hopkins, who shows that these negative stereotypes, she measured providers' levels of implicit bias, and these were providers and safety net clinics in the greater Baltimore area. That is, providers who cared enough to work with the most disadvantaged groups. Those who had negative, high levels of implicit bias, the quality of the doctor-patient relationship measured objectively, having videotaped it and having independent raters rate it, as also measured by the reports of the patients as to what was the nature of the doctor-patient relationship, was worse. Even among people who cared enough, to work with the most disadvantaged in our society. So all of us need to realize that this could be me. And the person who is set up to repeat 
the problem is the person who would say, I don't, I'm not prejudiced, I would never do that. Is there a text in the Bible that says, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall? Okay. The good news is, unconscious discrimination can be reduced under certain conditions. There's a study out of the UK, high-quality study, that says we can give you a drug. We can give people a beta blocker that eliminates implicit bias. This is absolutely true. By the way, what that illustrates is that there are some fundamental cognitive processes that are at work that can actually even be attacked pharmacologically. At the same time, I don't know that anyone wants to be on drugs permanently as a solution. There are a number of other strategies that work to um, reduce this. I usually like to tell people about the divine solution. Uh, Professor Patricia Devine at the University of Wisconsin-Madison has put together in a single program a number of strategies that are effective in reducing the implicit bias. Um, I don't have time to talk about all of the strategies, but let me mention two of them. Counter-stereotype imaging. If you believe, for example, that all women are weak, why not spend some time at night, just before you go to sleep, imagining a strong woman and what a strong woman would look like? That's called you're replacing the negative stereotype that you know you have with a positive one. Or let me give you another example, individuation. All of us process complex information by putting things into categories. Individuation says, I'm going to make a commitment and I'm going to take time every time I meet somebody to resist the temptation to put them into a category, social categorization is normal for all of us, and say, I want to focus on the unique individuality of this person and not assume things about them based on their gender, their race, their age. And that takes more time, but that's individuation. It's a, it's a strategy you can learn that can make a difference, but it takes a commitment and time to do it. Um, Researchers have also begun to talk about it's not enough just to have cultural competence. We need structural competence. And what do they mean by that? The biases in our society have shaped policies and procedures. So it's not just about changing the individual. We need people who need to understand and be aware of the ways in which these implicit biases have changed some of the rules and regulations we have and see what we can do to change those rules and regulations in the first place. What else can we do? We can improve America's health by providing comprehensive care for all. I'm going to give you an example from the state of Delaware. In the state of Delaware, there was a large racial ethnic difference in colorectal cancer incidence, in screening, and in mortality. And the state of Delaware implemented this statewide program that first of all provided free colorectal screening to every resident if you didn't have health insurance. And then they added free cancer treatment, and then they added outreach to disadvantaged communities, to poor people, to minorities, to make sure they were aware of the existence of these resources. And what you can see in just a few years, in about eight years, they eliminated the disparities in screening, they eliminated the disparities in the incidence of colorectal cancer, and they also eliminated, almost eliminated, the disparities by race in mortality from colorectal cancer. So it's a dramatic example that there's a lot that can be done just by improving access to care for all Americans. Next slide. Okay, care that addresses the social context is another uh, issue we need to, to address. Next slide. Um, the World Health Organization asks this question, what do we accomplish as healthcare providers if all we do is treat illness and send people back to live in the same conditions that made them sick in the first place? Next slide. One of the options to do this, there are many ways and there are many programs across the US right now that is trying to take a more holistic view of the patient. This medical legal partnership was born at the Boston Medical Center. Dr. Zuckerberg, the head of pediatrics at the Boston Medical Center, 
a primary care provider at that healthcare facility can refer a patient to a number of specialists. One of the, one of the specialists that they can refer a patient to is an attorney. You heard me right. The hospital has on-site attorneys to solve problems in the lives of patients. Take the example of a mother who comes with a child who has asthma, and the asthma is secondary to the poor housing conditions they're living in, and the mother has spoken repeatedly to the landlord, and the landlord has done nothing about fixing the problem. All the asthma medication in the world will not help that child breathe symptom-free if the child goes back and to live in the same housing conditions. And the landlord who has not listened to the mother it does make a difference when an attorney calls and says, you're violating the housing code of the state of Massachusetts, and we will sue you if you don't fix the problem. So they are using lawyers to help to address the problems that people face that helps them to improve their medical care. There are other examples in the state of Oregon or in the state of Minnesota where they have blended the Medicaid program with a direct link to social services so that when people get their medical care, they can also seamlessly receive the social services they provide, and it helps to improve their health because we are looking at their health um, holistically. Next slide. One of the other things we need to do is to keep the social safety net in place. Let's take a quick walk down memory lane that illustrates that. Next slide. In 1981, there were massive budget cuts in the United States. There was the Omnibus Reconciliation Act in the early Reagan administration. 500,000 people lost um, welfare. Um, a million people were dropped from food stamps. 600,000 lost Medicaid. Uh, cut funding cuts closed 250 community health centers across the United States. The WIC program had enough money to fund only a third of people who needed and were eligible for WIC, a million children lost reduced price school lunch, so there was cuts in social services that had pervasive negative effects. Next slide illustrates the health consequences. Within two years of those funding cuts, we had evidence of an increase in poor outcomes for pregnant women, increases in infant mortality in 20 states, increases in low birth weight in the United States, and more children with all kinds of problems in the emergency room. So when we weaken the social safety net, it has negative consequences for health. But we also need to move further upstream. Next slide. Um, we need to support initiatives that seek to make healthy choices easier. What I'm trying to say is that we need healthier behaviors in the United States in terms of reducing smoking, increasing exercise, reducing alcohol misuse, improving sexual health, improving mental health. All of those are vital things that we need to do. But we have to understand them within the context of the larger community in which they operate. Let me give you a concrete example of this. This is a study I did with colleagues in the city of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. What we found was that smokers in Milwaukee had much higher levels of multiple measures of stress than people who were not smokers. And we then developed a project in Boston using the electronic medical record to identify people who at their last doctor's visit were smoking and then randomize them to either just get connected to the quit line in Massachusetts or connected to a social worker who would help them with whatever challenges they faced and who would assist them as they try to make this decision to quit smoking. Next slide. And what we found was that people, the intervention group, were those who talked to the social worker compared to the other group, was the control group. Six months later, or nine months later, people who got their stressors in their lives addressed were much more successful at quitting smoking than people whose stressors were not addressed. The point is that it's a small example of taking the social context seriously can make an impact. And so we have to think of how we can make the healthier choices easier, how we can restructure life to, to build um, pathways in neighborhoods that encourage people to walk um, and that give them a sense of security and hope and that reduces physical, chemical, psychosocial stressors because all of these are strategies that improve health. 
One other thing we have to do is to start early. There's a very famous study from the state of Michigan. It was done in Ypsilanti, Michigan, that took African-American public housing residents, age three and four, gave them tutors who visited them at home and provided advanced preschool education to them. They've now been followed 40 years later. And what they have found, all the intervention was was a preschool intervention, improved the quality of preschool. 40 years later, those who got the intervention have higher levels of education, higher levels of income, higher levels of savings, higher levels of home ownership, fewer arrests, um, um, less use of the social service system over their lifetime, and for every $1 invested in the program, there's a $17 return to society. If you know where I can invest a dollar and get $17 back, be sure you let me know before I walk out of the room. But this is an example of a program that saves society money and dramatically improves outcomes for others. We have an example of a similar project in the state of North Carolina. Um, help me with the slide. Move to the next slide. Um, the Carolina Abyssadirian Project. It's the same idea, except that they enroll kids in it when they're three months old. Three to three months old to five. And the next slide shows in their mid-30s, sorry, in their mid-30s, lower levels of cardiovascular risk. Look at the striking differences in systolic blood pressure between the control group and the group that got an early quality education from birth through five. What I'm saying is we know what works and investing in our kids actually leads to improved health. We also have high quality evidence that if we improve economic well-being, it also improves health. In the last 60 years, the black-white differences in health have narrowed when the black-white differences in income have narrowed, have widened when the black-white differences in, in income have widened. We also know that if we improve neighborhood and housing conditions, given what I said about segregation, that has consequences for health as well. Um, this is the moving again. Moving to Opportunity was a program, high-quality scientific evidence. They randomized poor people in public housing to move to less poor neighborhoods, 10 to 15 years later. Remember, all they did was change the neighborhood. Just change the neighborhood environment. 10 to 15 years later, those who were moved, lower levels of obesity, lower levels of diabetes risk. Improved health linked to all they did was change the neighborhood environment. Next slide. I want to say that one of the things we need is comprehensive approaches. This is work of Barbara Reskin that shows that racism affects all these different systems of society, and we have to address all of these systems simultaneously in order to make progress. And I want to close with an example of a study that does that very dramatically. Next slide. It's, it's the purpose-built communities. And what's different about purpose-built is they sought in a single project to address all the social ills a disadvantaged community dealt with simultaneously. Next slide. So come with me to East Lake Meadows, Atlanta. Next slide. That shows you a public housing project, East Lake Meadows. Next slide. Um, with high rates of crime. Next slide. Poor quality housing. Next slide. Low levels of employment. The worst performing school in the greater Georgia area. I visited the Purpose Built Community site today, I mean, uh, a year and a half ago. Next slide. Dramatic transformation, dramatic reduction in crime, 90% reduction in violent crime, improved housing, improved employment. All able-bodied persons are employed, um, and the school is one of the best performing schools in the state of Georgia, although 60% of the students still qualify for federal reduced price lunch. What it shows is it can be done. Here is a community that did it. And you know what? Purpose-built communities is providing free technical assistance to any community in the United States that want to replicate their model. And there are literally hundreds of communities interested and are working with them 
wanting to replicate a model, and they already exist in multiple cities in the United States. Next slide, quickly. Um, what's holding us back? C can you go, go through those quickly? I'm not going to talk about what's holding us back. Let's move through them quickly. We need to build community capacity. Um, and the point about community capacity, there are groups within our communities that can work together to make a difference. But many of them need the skills and the resources so they can competently do a good job. And we need to think of what we can do to help them. The bottom line I'm saying is we have a lot of evidence that racism in multiple forms is alive and well, and it has pervasive negative effects, particularly through institutional mechanisms. However, there are strategies that we can implement to make a difference, and I want to leave you with two powerful quotations. Martin Luther King said, true compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar, it understands that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. And we've talked about multiple edifices that produce beggars. And finally, I end with the words of Robert F. Kennedy. Each time a man or woman stands up for an ideal, or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, he or she sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And those ripples can build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. I believe that your presence here today reflects the fact that you are a ripple of hope. And it is my prayer and my wish that as you work together to make your community the best that it can be, you can sweep down the mighty walls of oppression and resistance. Thank you. You're welcome.